I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocators.com. My guest on today's show is Charlie Ellis, the founder of Greenwich Associates, author of 16 investment books, and now a three-time guest on the show. The bookends of his published library, his seminal book, Investment Policy, and most recent work, The Index Revolution, discuss the case for indexing for most investors. Yet one of Charlie's most longstanding and passionate engagements proved the exception to the rule. His decade and a half of service on Yale University's investment committee, including nine years as chair. Charlie and I met about 25 years ago in that capacity, and he's occupied a front row seat to Yale's success ever since. With the recent passing of David Swenson, we decided to sit down and reminisce about David in a conversational tribute to the investor, man, and leader we both so greatly admired. We discuss Yale's investment committee, roster of managers, investment team, and the unique aspects that made David so great. We also touch on Charlie's latest book, the eighth edition of his seminal classic. Before we get going, hop on our website, capitalallocators.com, and sign up for our free monthly email to stay apprised of happenings around the show and receive our five best reads and listens each month. You can also join our premium community to add a weekly email that gets you inside Capital Allocators, connectivity to show guests, and my investment thoughts. Today's show is also sponsored by Tegas. With Tegas, you can learn about any public or private company directly from former executives, customers, and industry experts, all of whom are well-positioned to offer unique insights into a company's growth, customer value, and competition. What makes Tegas different is you don't have to lead your own expert calls. Tegas offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts, including favorites like Visa, as well as new IPOs like Teladoc and Snowflake. All you have to do is log in, and you'll get instant access to nearly 15,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part is that Tegas's collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts comparable or better than those on other networks cost just $300 per call to access. If you're ready to go deeper on any company or investing theme, head to tegas.co slash TED for a free trial. I can personally say that some of the most well-regarded and thoughtful investors in the world use Tegas and talk about it often. That's T-E-G-U-S dot co slash TED. Please enjoy my conversation with Charlie Ellis. Charlie, it is wonderful to see you. It's nice to have you here. And to be back in New Haven after a long time. So thanks for having me. I know David was near and dear to both of our hearts, and there are very few people that were in as close to his inner circle for as long as you. So I'm just excited to reminisce and talk about him. When did you first meet David? I was asked by T. Rowe Price to give a talk at one of their conferences, and I did not know David, so I would not have recognized him, but he was in the audience because he was going to give a talk later in the same meeting. I happened to talk about the difference between the business of investment and the profession of investment, and that the business was absolutely booming, but we should not let that distract us from recognition that the main job we had was the profession doing really well for families who were trying to save for education and managing endowments and pension funds for people who need to provide for their elderly security, but also for these wonderful institutions that are a treasure of this country. And that caught David just the right way. And he came up afterwards and introduced himself and what a lovely four or five minute conversation. And I realized, oh boy, this is a wonderful guy. I ought to get to know more about him. It did help that I had gone to Yale and he was at Yale. 
I'd gone to the college, he'd done a PhD, a little bit of a difference, but those institutional connections make a difference, and the conceptual connection makes a difference. A couple of years later, uh, he gave me a call and said, I'd like you to serve on our investment committee. Wow, you know, what, what a privilege. It's like being called by the Queen of England. I'd like to knight you. I mean, it's, just, it's the most important kind of an invitation. If you care about professional dimensions of investing, and I'm a little stiff on that, I really put the professional part first. The business part is really nice, but it is not the motivating force and it is not what we should be aiming for. We take it because it comes, but the real purpose is the professional side. And I understood that. And I think that was a key part of what David was looking for. And of course he lived that. So when David reached out to ask you to join the committee, what did he tell you about what that would mean? Nothing. (laughs) Oh, he said, we'll be meeting four times a year. Meetings go from nine in the morning till noon. And because you live in the New Haven area, you and I might get together once or twice. But he never gave me fair warning how demanding the work was and how hard it was. Of course, I could have figured that out by knowing David at all. I knew that he was superb and people who are really good at something put in an awful lot of extra time and effort. I've always liked Ben Hogan saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. That's true of all champions in every line of work. They put more into it. They work harder at it, and they expect everybody else to do the same thing if you're going to be on their team. So it didn't come as a surprise in direction, but the magnitude of work did surprise me. Four times a year, the documents to be prepared usually got it three or four or five days before the meeting, so there was enough time, but just barely. And you had to schedule in advance the time that you're going to spend. And for me, it was a guaranteed 12-hour day, eight in the morning to late at night, trying to be sure that I was on top of all the different dimensions of analysis and thinking that had been put together in these books. And, you know, they were inch and a half, two inches thick, and they were not single-sided. They were double-sided, and they were not double-spaced. They were (laughs) single-spaced. And you really had to be prepared to dig in because once you went into the room for the committee meeting, you were on deck You had to be completely prepared. It was like a military situation. If you're going to be with the Admiral, you want to be really squared away. Well, if you're going to be with David's committee, you'd better be squared away. And of course, the secret was he had all of us convinced that the other guys were going to do beautiful preparation. So all of us got really well prepared. So all of them thought they ought to do really good preparation, so on and so on and so on. But it was also, you knew David was paying attention. And if you ever indicated that you hadn't done your rigorous homework, you'd be ashamed of yourself. And it was fun. Nobody nobody felt that they were being imposed on. It was like having a big bouquet of flowers and being able to look at them one at a time, but carefully enough because you're going to take a biology test when the looking is over. It was a thrilling experience to see how good, really good work could be. How did the preparation evolve over the many years of your involvement on the committee? Well, the preparation didn't really change because it had gotten established as a standard before I arrived. And the diligence of homework had been established. It was a group behavior that was sort of a tribal commitment. And it wasn't any chance of anybody coming less than really carefully prepared. Everybody knew that they'd all done hard work and they were all glad they had done it because it made the conversations so productive. So what was it like inside those committee meetings? So everyone's done all of this homework. There are these memos, these recommendations. How did the process work in the boardroom? Well, we took each other one at a time, and the odds were exceedingly high that on each item that was being proposed, we would all fully agree before we got to the meeting that that was a good idea being recommended. Once, gee, once in 15, 16, 17 years, an item was withdrawn for further consideration, and of course, it never came back. But that's a long, long stretch of years with lots of really consequential decisions being made left, right, and Sunday. And there was nothing that we weren't prepared to examine up close and really pay attention to. So wide-ranging series of different possible questions and never any real doubt about the rigor and specificity and the detailing of the homework. I've served on 14 different investment committees, and the usual due diligence is four or five references for any major manager decision. Uh, Not at Yale. 15, maybe, 20, maybe, might even get to 25. And the rigor and depth of it, when I went in the military, I was going to be top secret cryptographic analyst. So I had to get cleared by the FBI. And they did 
call and talk to all the neighbors. What was he like when he was growing up? Did he ever get in trouble? Most of my neighbors were intimidated, but it was a wonderful discipline on the integrity of granting status to seize government secrets. It's the same sort of a thing. The reason for doing the meetings in a way was to increase another layer of due diligence and rigor. Because if the staff has done a really great job, and you would know from your own experience, the staff members who did the work knew damn well everything that they did was going to be discussed by the whole group with David leading the discussion and looking for holes and soft spots and weaknesses and imperfections. So if you just assume that that's actually what's going on, what are you doing at the committee? You take in one last look to see with a group of people who are chosen because of their different kinds of experience and their intensity of commitment to Yale, is there anything they might add? Is there anything they might ask? Is there any possible dimension that has not been thoroughly explored? And it's, it's interesting. We also were understood to be pledged. Nobody did it formally, but we all understood it to be pledged that we would never discuss what was in those documents. And when the chairman of the investment committee left ahead of me, he said, you know, I've really enjoyed this work and I enjoy the discipline. For the next two or three years, I'd like to receive these documents and quietly told David that's what he wanted. And David, being thoughtful enough to avoid getting into a public controversy, came to me and said, what do you think? So it was a layup question. The answer, no, not under any <laughs> circumstances whatsoever. And don't you dare do it, which was just what he wanted to hear from me. Yeah. So you mentioned that by the time you got into the committee meeting, it was already discussed that these were likely investments that were going to go forward. How did that process happen? We did not discuss things before the meetings. But it was understood once you'd done the rigorous homework and all of the ifs, ands, or buts had been developed quite carefully, very hard not to have everybody inclined to agree. There were some times when we would have an open discussion with two or three at most questions because of a very complicated matter or very complicated manager situation. But usually we went through those decisions really quickly because almost everybody, almost all the time, had completely the same view the others had, unless they had a peripheral vision of some sort. And it was part of the discipline and part of the excitement of being in that room at that time. It was a thrill. And how did David communicate with the committee members in between the meetings? He was always open to any question of fact or policy. And to the best of my knowledge, that was it. There was none of the apple polishing or brass polishing or let's be friends and let's develop a special rapport. Uh-uh, not at all. It's all very, very disciplined process. So in a lot of the more recent, call it science around decision-making and how people sort of think well in groups and behavioral biases that people have, it sounds from what you're describing that this was much more that David and his team did the work, they had their view, and the decision, not that the committee couldn't weigh in on it, but for the most part, that there was a deferential relationship to David and the team. Now, that'd be a big misunderstanding. Okay. Comes out to the same conclusion, but it different understanding. Best analogy I could give you, if you were talking to George Marshall during the Second World War and you had genuine questions that you wanted to be asking, think you were Secretary Stimson, for example, who was the Secretary of War. You might very well ask questions, but that was to satisfy your uncertainty, not to probe the lack of preparation or thoroughness of the other person. So Stimson would ask Marshall questions, but they were to catch up with Marshall, not to hold Marshall to a higher discipline. And that would be the kind of question that would come up in the meetings. The second thing was David very clearly chose members of that committee who individually would have something to contribute and almost always something that was different. When first people got involved with hedge funds, he was looking for people who understood hedge funds and that discipline. Private equity, the same thing. So he's always looking for the outlier or outrigger who would bring more and better perspective, insight, understanding to the group as a whole, and then expect us to be accountable for it. So when you step back from the committee and look at that work, I know you knew well how David ran the office and the, the people on the team. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that environment was like. 
Well, because I wasn't in the office, I guess the answer is it's a little bit of hearsay. But if you stand around for a long enough time, you get pretty good at what the hearsay must be. One was that work in the office was demanding. There was no doubt about we were dealing with major and important questions. And we are going to be rigorous in every kind of a way. And at some point, we ought to talk about discipline, 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 because it's just astonishing how rigorously careful to have been completely prepared and thorough in making every decision. You know, if anybody wanted to study a superb decision-making group, and as you know, I spent 30 years consulting with senior managements of financial service organizations all over the world and really got a lot of exposure to how decisions are made. Nobody ever did it better than David Swenson in the Yale investment decision-making process. And a key part of that was the wonderful quality of the people who were on the investment staff. Just a terrific bunch of people who want to talk about how did they get there and all that sort of stuff, because it's, I think, really important. And it's all part of a total package that, as far as I know, everything David did was done deliberately and had been thought through before it was done. There was no room for good luck. There was no room for artistic thrills. There was no room for the adventure of, oh, no, no. It was all really disciplined, and it was an intellectual discipline. You got to remember, he was one of the very top people to go through the PhD program in economics at Yale, and Jim Tobin was his dissertation advisor and senior mentor. And Jim was, all his life, the smartest person in the room, sort of like Janet Yellen today, just brilliant, totally well-informed, completely open-minded, knew all the theories, knew all the practice behind it, and modest, gentle human being with a buzzsaw for a brain and just a truly wonderful person. So that connectivity, Tobin wouldn't have chosen Swenson unless Swenson was superb. And years later, we all now can look back and say, yeah, Swenson was really superb. One of the things that I love as an indicator of that is that Dave is the first person in the world to do a derivative swap. First person in the world. And everybody in his organization said, oh, David, forget it. That'll never happen. Nobody does that sort of stuff. It's never been done. David said, well, I think the logic is pretty good. And I think the capability of the people that I have in mind to do it are pretty good. I'd, I'd like to give it a try. Oh, boy, <laughs> give it a try. Go ahead. But don't come complaining to me later on. So that kind of unusual talent, given total focus on one thing, what would be good for Yale and the Yale Endowment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, year after year after year after year, wrapped up in one of the nicest people you and I have ever met. And so connectivity with other people came quickly because the other people wanted very much to be connected. How would you describe his leadership style after you've canvassed the world with so many leaders in asset management? I'm back to George Marshall, I guess, really. A really good horseman. Olympic rider has very light hands and the reins are kept very, very lightly. The knees are formidable and the horse knows exactly what to do from the knees. And it's a similar kind of thing. What David would say out loud would be either humorous or very gentle, exceedingly gentle. But boy, because you knew he was doing all that hard work, you wanted to play his game his way. And it was candidly much more fun to do something really well than to do something with lots of entertainment values sprinkled around to fill in for not too well. If you were on David's team, you knew damn well you were going to work harder than anybody serving on any other team. That's just the way it was. And you knew you were going to learn more than you could learn anywhere else. Fair deal. Everybody on the team knew that excellence was the only choice. And so while they were pretty good at working together, they all wanted to do their part to be able to make a contribution to be recognized by David. And getting a at a boy from David was really unlikely and hard, but if you deserved it, you would know you just got the gold medal. That was a very important part of it. And if you get a team of people all working to be as good a contributor as they possibly can be all the time, boy, that engine turns over and starts to go, really hums very, very nicely. Part I like best is how do you get to be a member of the team? It's simple. First, you've got to get into Yale. Why is that? Well, because it's a first approximation. Everybody at Yale is really smart, really smart. And secondly, you've got all those students. How do you figure out which ones you want to take? Better get down and get to know them. How do you do that? You teach a class, a really hard 
challenging class that the very, very smartest students scuttlebutt among themselves. It was the hardest class I ever took, and I learned more than I learned in any other class I ever took. And if you're smart enough and willing to make something of your effort, this is a chance of a lifetime. So there's a large number of students apply. Then you pick and choose the ones that you want to have in your class. And sure enough, the class itself is really demanding. The amount of homework and the standards of expectation and the grading are all really hard. So if you do really well in that class and you've demonstrated you have great character, integrity, and that you're fun to be with, you're very likely to get an invitation to try out for a summer intern slot. And if you do really well in tryouts, you get to be a summer intern. And if you do well as an intern, which is not easy at all, I mean, it's like jumping on a freight train that's going fast, coming through town. If you do really well and show you really ought to be chosen, you'll be chosen to be a member of the staff for a couple of years. If after a couple of years, you've been doing fabulously good work and really, really, really highly regarded for your skill set and you're developed very rapidly, you might get an invitation to stick around for the longer term. So it's like a funnel, the wide angle at the beginning, 1,000 students a year at Yale, down to 25 students in the class, down to one or two chosen for summer interns, down to one or two chosen for the long term. It's just by the time you do all the sorting out, you know darn well what you're going to do is find some absolutely terrific people you could never find if you said, now I'm going to go out and find some more people just like that, but not bother about taking the course because you wouldn't know them well enough, not have them serve as interns. You wouldn't know them well enough and they wouldn't know you well enough. And all they know is that you've got a formidable reputation and a wonderful capability, uh, but awfully hard work. Why do they want to do that? And if they knew what it was all about, it's true of The people that are really great athletes know they're damn good athletes. Why do they go to places that have terrific coaches? Because they want to be the best they could be. And the same thing is true of young professionals. They all know they're really talented. They all know they've got lots of brain power. And they all know that the investment world is a honeypot of opportunities on the financial side. But what if you said, look, I'm only going to live once. And I've got the chance to be my very, very best at something that would really matter and it would matter for the rest of my life, who among us would pass up that opportunity? So once you have this team, let's just call them all-stars that have gone through this weeding process. I know you weren't there day to day, but what's your sense of what it was like, that kind of conduct in the office? It's like any really good organization in the investment world. And I've had the privilege of working with a very large number of very good investment organizations all around the world. Number one thing that you would recognize is it's quiet. And everybody's sort of at their desk and it doesn't look like anything's going on. You know, well, that's a very naive view. It's quiet because everybody's working very hard to figure out specific dimensions of a complex problem. Second thing is the ease with which people talk to each other, no matter who's at the top. So David Swenson's the most highly regarded invest professional in the world. Well, probably yes. And who's talking with him? Guy just joined us yesterday, but they look like they're friends and equals. Well, Swenson treats people as equals. And that's one of the reasons people get so highly motivated. They love it. And it's a thrill to realize what you're doing. And then go into a meeting and you realize, holy smokes, these guys are going after each other, hammer and tongue, asking each other really difficult questions. And I've never seen a group of investment people who were so focused on getting something figured out. And the other thing I was impressed by is the number of different people that they have contacted about this question. And they're bringing in all kinds of different sources of information and insight. Well, really impressive. It's not the normal thing at all, is it? No, it's not. So the other side of that is all these relationships with these fantastic money managers that Yale employed. And I was curious of your sense of what was the special sauce that went into so many of those relationships with often managers earlier in their stage of development being so successful and having that hit rate be so high over the years? Well, the analogy that comes immediately to mind is Vincent Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers. He chose really good athletes, but then he made them great football players. I think of Bob Kippeth, who was Yale's great swimming coach. For years and years and years and years, Yale had the best swimming team in the world. Why was that? Well, he chose very carefully the kids that he wanted to have. And then he had disciplines, 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 and he enabled them to become better. Or Coach K at Duke, he's not a friendly, lighthearted guy. 
He's very demanding, and he gets the very best basketball players he can find and makes them stellar, beyond imagination what they could have become with anybody else as their coach. And David did the same thing. So let's break down both sides of that. So the side of picking great money managers, what did you see in common patterns of those managers that David selected versus the many, many that you've known around the world that he didn't? Well, first of all, very few of the managers he chose at any time were at all widely known. They just were never widely known until after they had been chosen. I would guess if you looked at his list of investment managers, you'd find over 100. And having spent most of my career in the investment management business, I probably would have known of 25 or 30, would have known in detail one or none. So they were all unusual managers And the characteristics of that unusualness would be, first, that they were Yale chosen when they were first getting started. And then Yale would be a major account for them, usually their sole major account or their leading major account. And usually right from the very beginning, I will put you in business and I will put you in business with the following large account. And you got to that decision because you worked with David on how to design your firm in terms of your business strategy and in terms of your investment organization and your investment process. And I can't tell you how important that was and how exceptional it made the relationship between Yale as a client and the managers as managers. David was really interested in helping very, very good people. And by that, I mean, obviously, brilliantly talented, but also really strong character. And if you didn't have really strong character, David knew you can't get it. If you don't have it, you're not going to develop it. If you do have it, you're never going to lose it. So it's nice to have that characteristic as your single most important item that you're looking for. And the looking for it was why the due diligence was so extensive and detailed. It's why the interviewing process was so rigorous and the dimensions of that interviewing were multiple. Looking for something that is really good, but also looking very, very carefully for something that's almost really good. But the difference between a gold medal winner and a bronze medal winner or a silver medal winner is real, and it's internal, usually. It's, it's not the athleticism of the Olympic athletes that makes the differential. It's the need to do it really beautifully well. And David would be looking for that all the time. And if you're looking for that all the time, you're pretty good at figuring out when it's not there. So there's a lot of very smart people, CIOs, teams in allocator seats, endowments, foundations, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, but few that have had both the duration and the success that David had at Yale. So what was it about how David went about it that allowed them to have such a high hit rate on these effectively lesser known early stage managers? Well, in a lot of different ways of coming at it. Have you ever read Ted Williams' book on hitting? He lays out the places where the ball might come across the plate, and he labels, I can hit 450 if the ball comes there. I'll be 250 if the ball comes there. And he knew it. And, of course, the pitchers knew it. So they would try to adjust, and he would try to adjust to their adjustments, and they'd try to adjust to his adjustments, adjustments, and back and forth. I think people who are really good at selecting and evaluating managers are really good at the mathematics, obviously. They're really good at the psychology of the individual leaders. And they're really good at the psychology of the team that's working with the real leaders. And if you know that's what you're looking for, you will look for it with considerable rigor. And because nobody else has done that, the other guy, the investment manager, is not going to realize what you're doing until it's too late. And then He knows where you are, and you know where he is. And I think that's a key part of it. But let me come back to the larger question, which was, what distinguished Yale's selection of investment managers? Absolute imperative was the focus, first, second, third, on risk. Everybody looks at the rate of return success that the Yale endowment had, and it is a wonderful rate of return success. But the really great secret or the great lesson to learn is that David Swenson's focus at all times was first on risk and not taking unnecessary risk and using the capacity to take risk where it would really reward. But the 
thoroughness with which risk was minimized and brought under control, which never gets discussed, and nobody ever talks about it, and there's no way that you can report it. Here, blah, 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 blah. It just can't. It's the way it's done. But for David, it was starts right with character and integrity, the individuals doing the work, and then what is the process that they're trying to follow, and what is the nature of the work they're trying to do, and deep understanding in all dimensions and being sure that the managers truly understood what the riskiness of their situation really was. One of the unusual aspects of what happened at Yale over the years is the duration of the relationships with managers. And these are early stage managers. They're going through growth, some wildly successful growth, some volatility. How was David and the team able to manage through all of the challenges that everyone else faces in staying put with a manager? Well, the truth is, I don't know, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give you a best estimate. Keep in mind that David had a very long average tenure with his managers, very long. And what made it exciting and interesting and terribly difficult was most of those managers, their first major account was Yale. So at the very beginning, he got involved with the managers before they had demonstrated their ability to do all these different kinds of things. So you're estimating the ability of an individual or a team, and usually a team, to think through and be rigorous in developing their professional development strategy and their personal strategy so that you really understand what their motivating forces are. And then also to be sure it's compatible, their business strategy. It's a little bit like father-in-law prospect talking to a son-in-law prospect about what do you really have in mind to do with your contribution to this marriage to my wonderful daughter. And once you get that plan laid out, you can monitor reality against that plan pretty quickly. And if it's confirming, 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 then you know you've got something special. And if it's not, you go to the woodshed with that manager. And that was done from time to time. And sometimes the managers got the message. And sometimes they just couldn't. Uh, but I love it that most of Yale's managers were just getting started when they got their Yale account. And to have that longevity at the same time shows there was something really special going on in the selection of those managers. And the answer was that David had an unbelievable acuity for understanding and thinking through who's got what it takes. And his ability to say, no, we're not going to go with that guy. No, we're not going to go with that firm was notorious and magnificent. It was really hard to become chosen by Yale. And if you were chosen, you felt, I am sure, virtually everybody felt the same, an enormous obligation to stay faithful to what was it you had said with David. And if you were going to make a change, go to David before you've gelled on what the change is going to be, before you've decided what you're going to do, and say, David, I really would like to talk with you carefully about this, a change in the environment. And the markets are different than they were, and I think there's a way that we can adapt to that that would be very, very effective, but I need to have somebody who will give me a tough Dutch uncle critique and review of what I'm trying to do. Couldn't find somebody better than David Swenson. Brilliantly talented, highly disciplined himself, and really good at innovative thinking, and really good at integrity. And I come back to integrity, 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 because that was always the most important single thing going. One of the things I recall so well and learned so much from in my time working with David was that all the time he seemed to have a whole bunch of, call them small innovations or views of something subtle inside a manager or a market, or he used to hate airline stocks and any manager who owned them was off the list. I was wondering if you could think back to some of those small innovations that maybe were small enough that they didn't make it into pioneering portfolio management, but were little impactful things along the way. Well, truth is, there were lots of them, and they were secrets that David knew, and he knew that if he gave them away by putting them in a book, then they wouldn't be secrets anymore, and he might lose the comparative advantage that Yale had. It's like really great cooks do not want to give you a recipe. It's not that they're afraid you're going to reproduce it in their neighborhood. But they just, you know, it takes a lot of skill to develop it, and they don't want to make it something that's available. And you never know, somebody might serve it to you someday, three or four generations of exchange later. And where'd you get this recipe? Oh, I got it from Ted Sides. Well, where did Ted get it? Oh, you got it from so-and-so. Where did so-and-so get it? You got it from what? And pretty soon, oh, yeah, 
I gave it to that guy and said he would never share it with anybody. So I'll give you an illustration, and I love it because it's so trivial. Who are the counterparties that you're willing to do business with? And you make a list of all the different organizations that Yale was working with. It might be a dozen. And these are complicated relationships. All of the organizations are very large, famous names, really good at what they do, lots of technology to help them do it really well, and widely admired for what they're doing. And we are going through it as a committee, examining those organizations to see which ones should be deleted because they weren't quite as good as the others. Oh, uh, come on, you got to be kidding. This is standard stuff. Everybody does it all the time. Yeah, I know, I know. But I think there's always a risk that we might find somebody. So sure enough, Lehman was on the list years before the Lehman problem. And years before the Lehman problem, they were taken off the list. And why? Because if you examined it rigorously and carefully, you would realize they're not quite as good at this kind of work. And the people in the leadership role are not quite as high integrity. And there's no reason to take that risk. So we won't. And why aren't there any corporate bonds? Because the pricing of corporate bonds compared to treasuries doesn't reward for the risk that's being taken. Oh, you got to be kidding. Well, look back in history and you'd say, you know, that's true. That's true. And you got to be kidding. Nobody else would ever worry about those questions until it was too late. And then they would worry about them. And that was fairly typical. And the wonderful irony of Lehman, given that that's where David started his sort of Early it was early in his career, Lehman and Solomon Brothers. And so, so many times in those situations, you expect there to be relationships and affinity. Well, you got to remember, why did David go to Lehman and Solomon Brothers? Because after he got his dissertation approved and his orals approved, he turned to Jim Tobin and said, well, Jim, now that I've been cleared, which courses am I going to teach? And Jim Tobin said, oh, David, you're, you're not ready to teach. You don't understand how the world works. You understand all the theory better than anybody. You can do all the math better than anybody. And candidly, you're as good as anybody that we've ever seen in economics. But you don't understand what those really dreadful, misbehaving sons of bitches trying to steal money back and forth from each other, the real day-to-day in-the-trenches players in the financial world. And so you've got to go where the really bad guys, tough guys hard-hitting guys, hang out (laughs) and see what is it really like. So you can go to either two places, Solomon Brothers or Lehman Brothers. So he couldn't choose, so he did both. And he learned a great, great deal because he was always looking to learn, to learn, to learn, to learn, to learn, always looking to learn. One of the things that I think about now and going forward that we no longer have, David, anything you read over the last couple of weeks of what's been written about him You see words like integrity, discipline, principles, moral compass. And there are a lot of things that feel very unique to David. And yet, many of the people I worked with back then have left that office and are not David, but have gone on and done wonderful things and been very successful leading other investment organizations. And I'm really curious of your thoughts of what was so special that is just no longer replicable because David is no longer here. And how much of it was part of what he developed within the ecosystem at Yale that will continue on? Well, you remember Rudyard Kipling's wonderful comment, they can copy my grammar, they can copy my pages, but they can't copy my mind. David taught lessons that could clearly be learned. What he had that may never be matched by someone else at the same skill level of implementation that he had was the really amazing creativity with which he did his thinking. I don't know of anybody in the investment world that is as protean and creative as David. Part of it you have to recognize was the circumstances and the markets that were available. It may be that we'll never see those kinds of change-making markets again because so much has been figured out and restabilized. And markets are tougher today than they were 10 years ago. And they were tougher 10 years ago than they were 10 years before that. And they were tougher 20 years ago than they were 30 years ago. So people looking at creativity and investment management probably have to recognize, but it's very hard for them to do. So the markets are supposed to make themselves more and more efficient. That's what we all learned in Economics 101. And sure enough, that's what's been going on. And it's been going on for a long time. So 
David would have acknowledged that his two major areas of contribution to better returns, other than the risk control, which we talked about before, one would be willingness to look carefully at new asset classes, new kinds of investing, new ways of investing. And the other would be a very focused interest on new and differentiated managers. People who've got some specific edge they've developed or skill set or cultural value that going to make it possible for them to do a little bit better. And of course, you take away the negatives and are free to have just the positives come through. That is a part of it. But where he could have added maybe 200 basis points in each of those two dimensions, then it was 150, then 100. And I would guess it's down under 100 now, maybe in around 50. And there's not going to be another source that I know of. There may very well be because creativity is a fabulous characteristic of the markets. But there are limits to creativity also. I think the discipline of the Yale model or the endowment model is primarily the control of risk. And then secondly, within a risk-controlled base, always looking for ways to make a significant difference over a long period of time. And that takes you back to manager selection and types of investment selection and being willing to be clearly first to do something is an important part of it also. If you look at Yale today, the Yale Investments Office today, over what David's built over 35 years, you have starting with 30 something years of teaching this class with Dean with 20 students, there's 600 people out there that they have taught very carefully. There are these hundreds of managers, maybe a hundred in the portfolio, and certainly a number that may not be that had wonderful experiences with Yale. You have a bunch of people that David has trained, a smaller number that are both here and elsewhere. That ecosystem of intellectual capital, the, the Yale alumni base, how powerful is that if a 31-year-old David Swenson today was tapped to be the next CIO? You mean after he's given all the secrets away to a very large number of people and trained them up and led out into the world and they've just developed their own organizations and they understand the secret sauce is all about service and professionalism and integrity and they also know how to be really rigorous in their work? Yeah, I mean, it's a question that answers itself. It's tougher. You are coming out with the eighth edition of what was once called investment policy and now winning, winning the, the loser's, losers game. game. Yeah. What's new in the eighth edition compared to the seventh? The biggest information for people who are interested in the profession and for people who are looking for a good manager is the data documenting the inability of active managers to outperform other brilliantly talented, fully informed, fabulous equipment, active managers in very, very, very large numbers who have been making the market more and more and more efficient or close to perfect or accurate, whatever term you want to use. The privilege of having lots of opportunity has gone down and down and down and down. And the reason is ironic because the quality of active management has gone up and up and up and up. And that's the reason the opportunity has gone down and down and down and down. So talk about a group of people who are their own worst enemies. And we're talking about some of the most marvelous human beings in terms of talent, character, personality, ambition, drive, skills, any dimension you want. These are the people that I admire most. It's just terrific. But trying to beat each other is really, really hard. It really bothers me when people call indexing passive because nobody wants to be passive. Imagine, Ted, if I introduce you, this is Ted Side. He's passive. People say, well, I think I'll go talk to somebody else. <laughs> or how would your wife feel to find out that you're passive? If you think about it for a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Index investing was developed by a group of engineers, most of whom happen to be electrical engineers. And electrical engineers, the part that's got the two prongs is called the active part. And the part that's got the two sockets is called the passive part. It's not a negative, but take it out of context and spread it around. And everybody gets offended by being passive. Who the hell wants to be passive? But indexing has a neutral term. Doesn't irritate or offend people instinctively the way being passive does. So I believe deeply in indexing because I think the rational data is overwhelming that that makes a great deal of sense. But I'm in favor of active management of investments in a different context. I'm very much in favor of actively thinking through who are you and what is your problem and opportunity and what are you trying to accomplish? And if you don't do that rigorously and thoroughly, i.e. actively, 
you're going to make mistakes. There'll be mistakes of omission more than commission, but they're going to be very, very costly to you. So I'm a big fan of active investing in terms of strategy or portfolio structure or paying attention to who you are and figuring out who you are and what is right for you. That's one item that I think everybody could benefit from rethinking on that one. So a lot of the CIOs that talk to look at the pricing and landscape, particularly of public market securities, if not all markets, and say, that all makes sense, but the returns don't even look like they're positioned if you own those markets in a low-cost way to deliver what's needed for spending, and they've turned more and more to the private markets. I'm curious if you could weigh in on your thoughts of how do you apply that lens of the competition to the flood of money that's moving towards the private markets. Well, if you believe the purpose of markets is to make themselves better and better and better, then you might very well believe, as I do, that funds noticing the difference in rate of return in the past, we buy the past and we get the future. If you look backwards, it's an easy slam dunk decision to put more money into private equity. That's great. Now, what could go wrong with that? Easy. Too much money going into private equity. Well, have we seen any evidence of that? I have. You have. And I believe the world is paying attention. And if you look at private equity managers right now, most of them have a fair amount of cash ready, 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 ready. And they're looking for more and more possibilities. And there are more private equity funds organized every year that are taken out of the business. So that's growing. The number of really gifted young people that want to go into private equity is way up. Go to the Yale School of Management or Harvard Business School or Wharton or Kellogg or Chicago or Stanford, the student interest in going into private equity is huge. And so we're going to have lots of talented people going into private equity. And over time, they will arbitrage the difference, risk adjusted and liquidity adjusted, pretty well between publicly listed securities and private equity. If you gave me a chance for the next 10 years of my life to do private equity or not, I'd take it. Yeah, it might work out. Private equity organizations are doing a really great job of improving the efficiency of our economy. So with all of this money and all of this competition, I have to ask this hypothetical question that we don't know the answer to, which is if David stepped into a new seat tomorrow, and we were so fortunate to have him back, that had, let's say, $5 billion of cash, what do you think he would do? I think he would do what he did the first time. And this is the most important lesson he taught, but most people don't even pay attention to it. Who is the client? What are the characteristics that make that client unusual or even unique? And how can you devise an investment program that is very well suited to that particular client at this particular time? Every institution is different. But Charlie, I thought it'd be great to close by reflecting a little on David's legacy. Well, we won't know for at least another 10 years. I would guess, and I really believe this legacy is going to work because I think there are enough people who understood what David had understood is the extraordinary importance of our endowed institutions and the privilege of being an endowment manager if you're really good at it. And therefore, if you go into that community you should take the pledge to yourself and to the others in that community that you're going to work for excellence in every dimension that you possibly can. If that takes hold as firmly as I hope it will, then there will be a treasure that will last for a long, long time. Paul Cabot's legacy from when he was senior partner at State Street Research and Management, managing corporate pension funds and also the Harvard Endowment, has lasted for a long time. People who care about investing will read what he wrote. Ben Graham, David Dodd, those two guys put together in security analysis what has got to be one of the most thorough examinations, and it creates a body of knowledge and an understanding that is, yeah, it's completely out of date. No, it'll never be out of date. The things that really, really matter are right there. We can all learn from the great painters. We can all learn from the great musicians. And we can all learn from the great practitioners. I don't care when 
their era was. You can learn from them. Better to learn from people who are contemporary if you can find them because they're dealing with the world you're familiar with and you know how tough this world is and so on and so on. But I think we do see some really outstanding work being done. Uh, I happen, obviously, because he worked so long at Yale to have developed a wonderful friendship with Seth Alexander. Seth and cut out of the same cloth. He's the same kind of a human being. He understands the value of striving to do superb work for organizations that will be able to convert that financial wherewithal into activities and research and programs that change the world. Charlie, thanks so much for taking the time to talk about David and his wonderful impact on our lives. Certainly made a wonderful impact on my life for which I will be always grateful. It was a privilege of a lifetime. It's a little silly, but I should tell you, I took off this morning my Swenson bracelet, red rubber band that his sister made up. And three and a half years ago, when the cancer diagnosis was clear, she made them available. And I've worn it every day since then. And sorry, Ted, I'm just choking a little bit. I, yeah. Saying farewell to David Swenson is really hard. Yeah. Let's never yeah. say farewell. I think that's terrific. Why don't we close there? We'll give each other a hug and go from there. Thanks again, Charlie. Treat to be with you, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 